Since the involvement of NASCAR superstars Dale Earnhardt Jr., Kevin Harvick, Jeff Burton, and Justin Marks, notoriety in the Cars Tour and its competitors has skyrocketed. And the racing on track speaks for itself. It's true grassroots, hard-nosed, late-model racing at its best. And this show is here to bring that action to light. This is On Tour. My name is Buddy Pulley, co-host of the Big Motor Small Blade Podcast, joined, of course, by FrontStretch.com's lead Cars Tour reporter, Chase Folsom, or as we know him on this channel as Chuck. Chuck, are you as excited as I am to get this shit rolling? I absolutely am. This is awesome. Uh, the Cars Tour in itself has given me a pathway to have a career in journalism and everything to do with motorsports since I've it's all I've ever wanted to do since I was a kid is have a job in racing somehow. And I got involved with Front Stretch and I pitched this idea and was like, hey, let's cover the Cars Tour. And it has blown up over the past six months more than I ever could have imagined. We still have a long way to go. We are well on our way to something really special. And I think we already have something really special. And I'm glad that they're letting us do this show with our channel. So we work hand in hand together and I'm ready to get this started with the Big Motor Small Blade YouTube channel with my work with FrontStretch.com. Buddy, you're an awesome host. Thank you for starting this. Thank you for having me on. Let's get into today's content. For sure. Um, just want to start out by saying the car store and those aforementioned owners, I, um, I mentioned uh, that when they took over the tour, um, it, it's really brought to light all the competitors in the cars tour and given them the notoriety that they deserved. Um, you see guys like Carson Quapple getting a truck ride um, with with uh, Spire Motorsports last year at Bristol. Now he's getting an Xfinity deal with Dale Earnhardt Jr. at uh, at Richmond, or no, he's at Martinsville. Oh, yeah. And then we have guys like Butterbean who's getting a truck ride at uh, at North Wilkesboro, and even you know outside the car store with Bubba Pollard running a JRM car at Richmond. Um, it's just brought an overall level of notoriety to late model racing in general and it's so good to see yeah it's um when jack mcnally started the series back in the end of 2014 with the inaugural inaugural season being in 2015 it was meant to take over from what was the hooters pro hooters pro cup series I knew i was gonna mess that up once but it's okay and i think they had visions for it blossoming into something special one day but I don't think they ever quite imagined this. And when those four guys, obviously their accolades speak for themselves, when they take over any series, the notoriety is going to skyrocket. And it has, they've already made big changes. The new sponsor this year was Z max. It's a big time sponsor for a grassroots series going to new tracks. Obviously North Wilkesboro is going to hold a championship event for the first time in its history at the end of the season with the cars tour. And the Smart Tour Modifieds are going to be co co hosting that event, I guess you could say. So co headlining. Co headlining. There you go. All around, they have, and not just in the late model world, but with the help of the Modifieds too, they have just allowed grassroots racing to thrive and give it a, a kind of a new life that it desperately needed a couple years ago. And obviously, Dale Earnhardt Jr. headlined that. But the other three as well, Harvick, Marks, and Burton, are all really involved in the series. I'm so happy to see it doing well. Yeah, I mean, we all know the Dale Jr. effect it has in motorsports, and we're seeing that to its fullest here. Um, our first race of the season was, of course, this past Sunday at Southern National. supposed to be Saturday. Obviously, weather uh, pushed it to Sunday. Um Southern National, for me personally, it's a special place. Uh, it's where I actually saw my first ever late model race. Um, I remember going there for the first time in 2007. I saw guys like Jeremy Mc McGrath, the uh, the Supercross racer, guys, uh, Curtis Truex, uh, Martin Truex's cousin, um, Richard Boswell, he's a crew chief in the Xfinity Series now. Guys like that cutting their teeth in JRM late models. Um, as well as Denny Ham when I saw him whip up on him one night and the Thanksgiving Classic at Southern National. So to go back uh, these past couple years with the Cars Tour it being the opener, it's been really, really cool to see. 
Yeah, um, they started – their very first race was actually at Southern National in 2015, and Todd Gilliland actually won that race many years ago, funny enough. So they went two years there, and then they went two years off, two years back. They took two more years off, and now they're back for the second year in a row, and hopefully Southern National is now here to stay. Now, this was my first time at Southern National, was the past two weeks for Speed Weeks with the Cars Tour, as they called it. But uh, while that was my first time and some things changed, some things stay the same. And what stayed the same was the guy at the top of the leaderboard. How about Carson Quapple picking up the season opening win at Southern National, defending his two-time championships? Yeah, yeah. I mean. Yeah, I mean, Carson, you know, like you said, he uh two-time champion. Um, and he is actually going to miss a race this year which he's done before and still won a championship. He's off to a great start uh, with the season. He's obviously going to miss that race at Hickory because he will be in Martinsville running the Xfinity car for JRM. Um, he's looking for his third Cars Tour title in a row. And Chuck, you actually got to speak to Carson after the big win. Carson, that last caution comes out with six to go, and you had a comfortable gap over Connor Hall. Now you have to restart with the 22 right behind you. What's going through your head through that process? Yeah, I was trying not to get too nervous, honestly. Uh, I've raced with Connor the past few seasons in this car store deal, and I know how he can race, and uh, it, it, it gets good usually at the end whenever he's going for the lead. So uh, I knew we just had to get out, get out front, and just try to get a gap. I felt like we had the better car, but I felt like maybe he could hold with us for five laps. So uh, I, think, I think I felt a little tap into one one but I was able to get a good launch off two and just build a gap one more thing there's been a lot of talk about how this is the toughest car store field we've ever had how does it feel for you as a two-time defending champ to still come out here and win the opener does that send any, any kind of message no it's awesome I mean uh, I guess just kind of show that we're over after the offseason nothing changed to this team and Brian still brings a really good car to the racetrack week in and week out uh, so, yeah, that was Carson Quapple after his big win at Southern National. It was a typical Carson Quapple day. There was nothing flashy. He didn't light the world on fire in qualifying, started eighth on the day, just methodically worked his way through the field. But when it mattered most, he was there at the end, and he got the lead from Brent Cruz on that late race restart, led the final 35 laps. And you just talked about it. He's going to miss Hickory when he has to go race. I say has to. Gets to go race at Martinsville in the JRM Xfinity car. Huge opportunity. opportunity. Huge yeah. opportunity for Carson in his career. But it's left a really big question. Can he still win the title? So two years ago when he did it, obviously the field wasn't nearly as tough. But the best way to make sure you can do that again is to win races. And he's off to a great start. Obviously, there's no better place to start doing that than in victory lane. And that's exactly where he ended up. So he's on the right path. I, a couple other comparisons. Josh Berry kind of tried to do the same thing in 2018. Uh, Deke McCaskill came up short. I believe it was either 17 or 16. You can go to Cars Tour Digest and find all those stats. There's a couple guys that have come really close, but Carson's actually the only one to miss a race and win the championship. So if anybody can do it, he can. Awesome. Well, Carson obviously won the race. Huge win for him. Let's take a look at the full results from Southern National. Taking a look at the results from the ZMAX Cars Tour, Kevin says yes .com, 125 from Southern National Motorsports Park. In the end, it was two-time defending champion Carson Quapple picking up the win, with Connor Hall coming home second in his second outing with Nelson Motorsports, and three-time Southern National winner Deke McCaskill rounding out the podium. Chase Burrow picks up his second Cars Tour top five of his career coming home fourth, with Caden Honeycutt rounding out the top five. Brent Cruz led a race high 82 laps but has to settle for 6th, with Mini Tyrell in 7th, Clay Jones in 8th, Trayton Lapsevich in his car store debut in 9th, and 3-time champ Bobby McCarty coming home 10th. Lane rigged in a part-time schedule for KHI, starts the year with an 11th place finish with Buddy Isles Jr. in 12th, RNS Race Cars newest member Logan Clark in 13th, Katie Hettinger 14th, and Ronnie Bassett Jr. in 15th. Brandon Pierce in his debut with Carroll Speed Shop comes home 16th, Josh Goyne in 17th, Jacob Hefner in 18th, Butterbean Queen after a spin in 19th, and Gavin Bochelle in 20th. Bryce Applegate comes home 21st with Ryan Millington in 22nd, Cameron Boland in 23rd, Jamie Caldwell in 24th, and Cade Brown after overheating issues coming home 25th. 
Pole sitter Chad McCombie led the first eight laps, would have brake issues late in the race and has to settle for 26th. Andrew Grady saw a strong run go out the window with a late race accident, has to settle for 27th. Trevor Ward, the Martinsville 300 winner from last year, with an alternator problem, will come home 28th. Ryan Joyner in 29th. And rounding out the field is Mason Diaz with a fuel system issue in 30th. Not on the list because they did not qualify for the 30-car field was Jonathan Finley, Cody Dempster, Stephen Nassie, and Landon Huffman. Now, one guy you didn't see on the results page was Landon Huffman, obviously a fan favorite. Unfortunately, with the stacked field at Southern National, he missed the show. Chuck caught up with them after qualifying. Here's that interview. Landon, first of all, what happened on the qualifying line? We've been terrible all week, so nothing different happened in qualifying than it has all time. This wasn't good enough. I don't know, something obviously significantly wrong with the race car, not turning at all, so I've done all I could, and uh, you know, I've done this deal, and it's going to be a challenge. I'm trying to do it myself, and you know, Jimmy Moore he gave me everything that I needed to be able to do that. And, uh, just came up short, obviously, by a long shot. So I'm gonna have it at uh, RNS Race Park on Monday. Let Marcus go through the setup with me and see where I, where I went wrong, what I did wrong, and hopefully I learn from it and try again in a couple weeks. So obviously, Landon was not really happy after qualifying at all. I don't expect him to be when you qualify dead last, but he did say there that there was something seriously wrong with the race car, but he didn't know what. So Monday morning. Him and the team took the car up to RNS Race Cars and let Marcus Richmond take a look at the car, and they found that the left rear shock mount on the car was actually not an RNS Race Cars part like they thought, and therefore their measurements were off, and the left rear of the car was actually an inch higher than they thought it was, which threw off the rest of their measurements and basically trashed the entire setup. So as Landon said, if you go watch his vlog, we're not as dumb as we thought we were. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Yeah, Super Landon related. is absolutely going to turn their season around, but when your left rear is an inch higher off the ground than you thought it was, that's not a great start to a setup by any means. I do want to say shout out to Landon. Thank you for giving that interview. Obviously, it takes a true professional to give an, inter an interview in that moment, and he handled it like the true professional that he is. So, yeah, Landon's got an uphill battle now, obviously. We just documented with Carson. It's hard to miss a race and still win the title. It's even harder when you're starting a brand new race team, basically. I mean, he's with Jimmy Mooring, but he's working out of his own shop. He's never done it before. He's documented what the challenge is going to be. It's even harder to get off to a start of missing the first race. So he's got an uphill battle, but he's got a lot of talent. They're going to turn it around this year. For sure, for sure. And uh, yeah, Landon Huffman, you guys shared a little bit of uh, Twitter love uh, after, <laughs> after the... Uh, after the interview there, he thanked you very much for your coverage of the Cars Tour, and we thank you very much for the coverage as well, Chuck, uh, providing us with this great show. Now, um, getting into the actual race, uh, tires were a huge discussion, a new tire for the Cars Tour this year. Chuck, give us some insight on what that new tire is and what the difference is in 2024. So pretty much, I'm not 100% knowledgeable on the tire, I'm not going to lie and say I am, but I do know it's a much harder tire. So the goal is that the tires don't just disintegrate in 20 laps, so the guys can actually go out there and race. Because you saw a lot of races last year at tracks like Southern National. We're going to see it either way at New River in two weeks. Um, but North Wilkesboro as well. The higher tire wear tracks, a lot of guys just kind of waited around for much of the race and then charged at the end. We're not going to see as much of that this year because the tires don't wear out as much so the guys can actually go out there and race. Carson Quapple documented it in his interview in a clip that you didn't see. Uh, we'll get to that in a little bit. And um, Connor Hall actually said the same thing, that the tire was harder. They kind of expected it to not wear out as much. Deke McCaskill had some comments as well, but basically all of them said it raced a lot different, but they were allowed to go harder for longer. And uh, Deke had some comments on that, so we're going to play that now. Deke, it looked like the track really struggled to take rubber today. Is that something you noticed in the driver's seat? Did it change maybe the driving yeah, style was, throughout the race? Yeah, it was really green in qualifying. It surprised me how fast it really got. But, you know, we had a lot of rain, and I just figured the weepers were going to come out really bad. And just, I was just anticipating a really treacherous racetrack. But, uh, yeah, it won't rubber it up at all. And it was just, you know, the bottom was okay. But, man, it was just it's the slickest it's ever been up top here. It just gets so bad. And it's just, you know, I kind of hate it. You know, I'd rather see some better racing up top. You know, we used to be able to do that here. 
you know, uh, Diaz is always uh, up to something. You know, he might uh, mix up some chemicals for the next time we come down here and make it, uh, make it work a little better for us. Thank you. So, yeah, Deke gave us some great insight there. Um, I did notice something as well. Um, I remember watching the race at Southern National last year. And like a typical Cars Tour race, the the whole goal for a lot of it, or for the majority of the first portion of it uh, before this new tire, was to keep the rear tires on the damn thing, right? Um, and to me, it seems like that... You didn't see that as much this year. It seemed like more of a four-wheel drift, and that that seemed like it was definitely a direct correlation with the harder compound tire. Yeah, I mean, I kind of asked Deke about that, and I kind of asked Carson about it too. And basically, what they all brought it back to is with the harder tire, there's not being as much rubber laid down on the racetrack. Well, when there's not as much rubber on the racetrack, it's still slick. The track's going to stay green for longer, so it's going to stay slick for longer. So therefore, and it wasn't hot either. It was, you can attest to this, it was pretty cold yeah. uh, last Sunday. So with the lower tire temps and no rubber in the racetrack and a green racetrack, harder tire, you're just going to be four-wheel sliding off the corner. And a lot of guys felt that, but it also allowed them to go harder for longer, which anytime the late model guys can push for longer and race each other hard, it's always a good thing. So I think they, so far, we'll see after, in a couple of weeks, we got a couple other tracks that are going to put it to the test. But I think as of right now, they hit the nail on the head. Yeah. And um, I also wanted to bring up to, um, you said that uh, going harder for longer. Um, I know a lot of people during the uh, Daytona 500 this year for NASCAR, they complained a lot about the fuel savings and how they just kind of rode around for a long time and how that's not necessarily the, the type of racing we want to see. But I drew a direct correlation to kind of how late model racing was last year and in previous years was it was a lot of riding around. You saw guys like Butterbean hang out in the back for you know, majority of the race. And then when it was time to go, those guys who would save tires went. And I, I just want to understand the, the, I guess, you know, we praise car or uh, late model racing in general for being so good. And then we, we are so frustrated with the fuel savings in a, in NASCAR racing. I just want to know your take on you know how that exactly is different or is it different? And we're just, you know, bias. I don't think it's any different, honestly. I okay. think it's just the crowd you're catering to. We need to take tire width. Wait, no, that's not it. We need to take brake size out of the... Oh, wait, no, that's not it either. We need to take the independent rear... Oh, that's not it. We need to put more horsepower in the car. That's what we need to do. It isn't that hard. I don't have pet peeves. I have major psychotic hatred. You got the playoffs. You got the caution clock. You got the apron at Phoenix. We'll call back to a, a, a philosopher that um, we had on the show. I think the direct quote from him was, this was a Toyota butt f Yeah, uh, Shane Van Gisbergen is the greatest race car driver in the f world. I mean, you're not getting any argument on this podcast. We wouldn't have to worry about Bristol sucking next week if it was just on the dirt. You're damn right. Um, You're damn oh right. Oh, God. Bristol dirt oh sucks. Oh, God. Welcome back. Now, one of the biggest stories of the race, aside from the winner, was Brent Cruz, the 15-year-old driving for KHI, who absolutely dominated the early portions of this race until lap 90 when he jumped the restart. Um, Chuck, you, you have, uh, I have my opinions on this. You have yours. Um, what, what do you think? It's close. It's absolutely close. But, and I think a lot of people get caught off guard and confused because a lot of racetracks have their own restart zone. And there's usually a line painted on the racetrack for that restart zone. But the car store brings their own personal restart zone to every track that they go to. It's marked with a banner on the wall because it's sponsored. And then I, th I do believe they paint the two lines on the track. That's not just graphic that they put on the screen for you. So, yeah, there's two lines on the racetrack that start the beginning of the restart zone and the end. The rule in the rule book is cut and dry. If you fire anywhere before the line, it's a jump. If it's egregious, they'll put you back. If it's not, they'll give you a warning. It was really close, but he fired a little bit before the line, which is why they called it off and gave him a warning. What's 
funny about it is it doesn't look bad because Carson was almost doing the same thing and prepared for it. So it looks like Carson it jumped too. Like, yeah, it looked, it looked like, like they both jumped. It looked, it looked like they both like, jumped. It. it looked like Carson jumped first to me. Well, like, I don't honestly. I don't know. It's 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 a camera angle thing. It's tough. Only they know. Yeah. But so obviously they call the restart back and then the second restart, you know, whether yeah. that was so well, well to compound those issues for Brent Cruz, uh, he then misses a shift on the next restart, uh, which complete pretty much ends his chances at winning this race. Um did do you think uh do you think Carson snuckered him there? Yeah, I think he did. <laughs> yeah. I think he did. I think that was one of those deals where Hey kid, watch this. Carson I think Carson got away with one on yeah. that restart, but it's one of those deals where like all you gotta do is tap it a little bit and he sees he thinks you're gonna go, oh crap, I gotta go. Well as soon as Brent hits the gas, doesn't matter if he spins the tires or not, Carson can go. And I think that's ultimately what happened is Carson baited him, Brent spun the tires, and then he's like, shoot, I got to catch up, misses a shift, and now you're you're fourth. So it's – look, he's 15. He led 82 laps of his second ever late model stock race in the Cars Tour. That is dang good. And he's going places, and he very well could be a title contender this year. So – that's just one of those situations where you got to live it to learn it. And he's going to live and learn because he's going up against one of the best and he's Carson's well on his way to being one of the best drivers in late model stock car history. He's already one of the best in car store history. So that's tough competition and he's a veteran and he got him and there's not much else to it. And with that, Carson was on his way to his 10th Cars Tour victory. Brent Cruz, he's got some catching up to do, but he's still young, and he's in a fast race car in that 29 KHI Toyota. Frontstretch.com is where you'll find all your racing content in one place for free. They have it all from NASCAR to F1 to IndyCar, grassroots racing, and even iRacing. Frontstretch has you covered with daily news for every series, weekly columns, and even on-site coverage at every NASCAR and Cars Tour event. Head over to frontstretch.com, subscribe to their YouTube page, and give them a follow on X to get your daily fix on all things motorsports. Chuck and I want to obviously give a big shout out to frontstretch.com for helping make this possible, um, providing us with interviews that Chuck goes and gets for them. Um, Chuck, where are we going next race? So in two weeks' time, I guess a week and a half now by the time you see this show, We will be going to New River All-American Speedway in Jacksonville, North Carolina. A little clash at the coast, if you will. Last year, Butterbean picked up the win. It was what at the time was his second win of the season, which catapulted him into a late season charge for the championship where he came up five points short, ultimately. The name of the game at New River is going to be tire wear, tire wear, tire wear. If you thought it was bad at Southern National, you got another thing coming because New River has not been repaved in 25 years. It is essentially Wilkesboro adjacent at the beach. So it's the name of the game is take care of your equipment. It's on full display when we go to New River because, you know, the track just gets sandblasted naturally year round. So we need to to get a cheese crater like Larry Mack to, to have on the show. It's rough. So. Honestly, your one to watch for next week is absolutely going to be Butterbean. He's the master when it comes to saving tires and taking care of your stuff and being there at the end. That's how he won last year. That's how he won Wilkesboro last year. That's how he's won plenty of races at Langley. So expect more of the same from him. Connor Hall is going to have a good shot too, but I think Butterbean is the favorite. You think Butterbean, you think he's almost the silver fox of the car store? I mean, he could be. He because there's some weeks where he just goes out there and he whoops them. Like, there's no doubt about it. He is the man. And then there's some weeks like last year at New River. At one point, he was running, I believe it was 18th. He was running really far back there. He was the last car on the lead lap. Logan Clark was about to lap him. He never did. And then in the last stint of the race, right to the front. And he won the race. Yeah. He's got it figured out. He knows how to be there at the end. And nobody's figured it out like he has for whatever reason he's mastered it. It probably has something to do with growing up, you know, in the Virginia beach area, racing a lot at Langley. You learn how to take care of your stuff because he's great there too. Obviously two time Hampton heat winner. He's won 
couple track championships there as well. So, yeah, he um, he's definitely got them all outsmarted when it comes to the old tire wear situation. <laughs> Now, before we go, uh, I listened to the Dale Jr. download today, and he had a guy on there by the name of Jefferson Hodges. He's the team manager at Penske now, but back in the day, he was big in the late model world, and obviously, if you're listening to the show, you love late models. Recommend giving that a listen. He talks a lot about uh, late model stock racing in the mid to late 90s. Uh, he did some racing with Robert Powell, and he also helped start the JRM late model team, and obviously, we've seen how dominant they've become, so... It's a great listen. Um, thank you guys so much for watching the first episode of On Tour with Chuck Folsom. I'm Buddy Pulley. We'll see you in two weeks after New River.